So coming up next, our next presenter will be talking about choices. Choices as Kanaka Maoli, as Hawaiian nationals. Um, she's very, very well versed in Hawaiian kingdom law and international law and United States law, constitutional law, just like Kilikina. Um, so if, can we give a round of applause for our next presenter, Ruth Bolome? I got this information because I asked a lot of questions. I did not um, uh, grow up here when I was six years old. My grandmother had me live in the mainland. Her, um, or I'm going to say the continent, um, her idea was that I should learn how to think as a Westerner. And the purpose of that was if I could learn how to think like a Westerner, I could understand what they were doing and how they were doing it to us. So when I came back here in 2000, I um, did not plan on getting uh, participating in, in any part of the sovereignty movement. I wasn't really interested in knowing about my genealogy. I was just coming back here to raise my child. And um, my husband and I took over my father's farm, who had passed away. And two months before he died, um, he had told me that he wanted me to take over the farm. Well, this was pretty strange to me because our whole life, my brother was supposed to get the farm. And um, my father's Portuguese, so the males get the land, yeah? And, uh, but my father said to me, uh, he wanted me to take the farm because I was gonna need that land to one day make right the wrongs. And I didn't quite know what that meant because um, I was a fashion designer in LA. I was making uniforms for resorts and, and theme parks, and I was thinking, what could I do? And I ended up um, coming back home thinking that what we were gonna do was turn the farm, that was a conventional farm, into an organic farm. So we got into the GMO movement and that sort of thing. And um, what was, the Kapuna has a way of really teaching you at least for me. And what they did was they set me in the middle of two organic farmers. But the organic farmer that was west of me um, was spraying Roundup and saying she was organic. And that Roundup was coming in our house. So within six months of coming back here, I couldn't remember my husband's name. When I'd look in the back seat of my car, I didn't know whose baby that was. It was my daughter, until she'd say mommy, I had no idea who that was. And I thought I was still driving in California. So I would get lost a lot. My husband knew there was something wrong with me, but we really didn't quite know what was going on because he was getting kind of lolo too. And um, you know, we'd look at the mail to see each other's name kind of thing. So what happened was um, uh, by 2002, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and a couple doctors told me I only had a year to live. And so, well, actually what they said was, people in your condition don't do well after a year. So I said to the doctor, you know, you, you always told me I never fit into the statistics. Why are you trying to stick me into the statistics now? And I said, so what I'm hearing is, you don't have the answer to heal me that doesn't mean I can't be healed. And up to that point, I didn't want to, I didn't believe in a lot of the conventional medicine. I didn't know all the alternatives because I was pretty strong and really get sick. I ended up learning about um, healing. You know, la'au, lapa'au, different alternative medicines like bioenergetic medicine, homeopathy, learning how to use my own body to heal myself. And um, that was done through different techniques where people, um, different clinics were drawing blood and making medicine from my own blood and I'd have to inject it into myself. It actually healed the fibromyalgia. It healed everything. 
whoops, now it's 2018. So I guess they were off a little. <laughs> I guess I have a little more to do here. But in the process of doing all of this, um, there were many different events that happened. We learned how to grow our own food. We learned, my training is in design, so I always look at everything from a perspective of beauty. And one of the things that I um, wanted to do was to make sure that our farm was very beautiful and inspiring and energetically soothing to my soul. And anybody that would come there, I wanted them to feel the same thing. And so we went through the, the um, process of learning feng shui principles, permaculture principles. And what I liked about the permaculture principles was really that um, that was built uh, upon um, by a man named Bill Mullison from uh, Australia. But he learned those principles in the 70s when he was hanging out with Tukapuna on the big island taking care of an ahupua'a. So the permaculture system is actually built on our system, but what he did was he merged it with modern technology, so the old and the new. And that really was exciting to us, so we learned a lot about it. And then I put in my um, experience with design, and I really wanted to create Eden. I wanted edible gardens. So everything around us had to be used for, had to have some kind of use. In permaculture, they say it has to have at least three uses. So um, we either had flowers for lays, decorations. Um, some of them, we started growing edible flowers. Um, then we had food. So the trees were also for, um, for windbreaks, food, medicine. Everything had to have multiple purposes. And um, so that was one phase of me coming into being a Hawaiian wahine. And it was just part of my journey. Now, the other part of the journey that was going on was my daughter was going to Kamehameha schools. And, um, or she went to preschool, and then in seventh grade, we had to reapply. Well, now they threw the, the criteria that I had to go further in our genealogy. I didn't know anything about our genealogy. I remembered a couple of names, and so I hired a genealogist that um, went looking in the names, and she warned me that it was likely that I wouldn't find anybody. And um, she said she was looking for one of her tutus for the last nine and a half years. But the next day she called me and she said, oh my God, I found your genealogy. And apparently, one of my tutus, John Mahiai Kaniakua, was um, a classmate of Queen Liliokalani at the Royal School, and um, he was also an attorney. And he documented things very, very well. So every time we, we would go into documents, there were full genealogies. There were references to other papers. There was land, and I had no idea what all these things meant, because there were little puzzle pieces on papers, you know, and they would have the old Ely names or the old Ahupua'a names, and I had no idea where that was at. So that started me on my journey of asking the question, who are these people? How do you say their names? And where are these lands? And so, and, and if we had these lands through a probate, where are they now? So that's what started me on my, on my travels and journey to learn about land titles and learning about what we were entitled to. Now, one of the things that I learned was when you are going into um, uh, learning about your lands, a lot of times you start getting summons to court. And, um, because, and the way you're summons to court is with your tutu's names. Well, I could have been summons to court before, but I didn't know my tutu's names, so I never went. But now all of a sudden, not only did I know my tutu's names, my friends knew my tutu's names. And they kept calling me, you gotta go to court, you gotta go and intervene, you gotta do this. So I did, and um, I really had no idea what I was doing. But after a few years, I found out that the remedy was not in these courts. I realized there was so much theft, so much fraud, and I was going to the thief, asking the thief to be in judgment of himself. So what's the likelihood of justice and fairness and truth there? 
There's none. Well, my husband's from Switzerland, and I was always intrigued. He's from Geneva, and I was always intrigued about the UN. And so I kept thinking, the answer's at the UN. So in 2015, I went to the UN, and um, at the UN, they, um, in three hours, I was like, oh, there's nothing that we can get done here. You know, these people, it's all political. You know, it's like you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, and if you have nothing to give me, well, you know, you're to the side. And so I started realizing we needed to have something to get something. And I couldn't quite figure it out the first time, the second time, but the third time. Third time was a charm. The third time when I went, um, there was supposed to be six of us that went under an NGO, which is a non-governing organization. And um, out of the six people, for some reason, only I went. And, you know, people's funding fell aside. They had other things that happened. Well, when you go um, to these, the Human Rights Council meetings, you have like two minutes to talk on, on the floor. And uh, you have to talk about something that relates to what they're talking about, even though it has to do with your country. But it has to be something that's in relationship. You can't just bring something up. So I had people that was helping me write up issues to fit our issues into the current uh, subject on the floor. One of the things that an international attorney said to me was, hey, aren't you a lineal descendant of Kamehameha? And I go, yeah. And he said, well, you need to make a, a political protest. And I go, what for? And he goes, because that's the only way they're going to listen to you, because now they have to listen to you. And I said, OK, how do we do that? And so um, they, I had an international attorney write something up for me. And he goes, read this. You have two minutes. So up to that point, every time I spoke, or anybody spoke, you would have everybody in the, the main room. They're on their phones. They're typing. They're, they're listening, but really, they're not. And after I made the, the two-minute um, uh, declaration, the place got silent. And I was like, hmm, this is interesting. And one of the gifts that I was given is that I see colors. But I only see two colors. I see dark, when people are lying or, or not being truthful. And I see golden, when the kupuna and God is telling me to go in a certain direction. Well, at the moment that I saw everybody turning around and looking at me, the dome in the room turned golden. And I said, OK, there's something here. I don't know what it is, but there's something here. And right after that, I kept getting invited to meetings. And as I would walk down these long corridors, the end of the corridor, light. And I was like, OK, we're on our way. What I wanted to share with you today is our choices based on certain events that recently happened. And um, I want to prepare you for what I think is to come very shortly. Like this year. Some people say I'm optimistic, but I get to see the golden light. So <laughs> anyway, so um, what I'm, what's here is with all the information out there, what do we do next? Right? So there's some, we, we all have pieces of this puzzle, this, this journey that we're about to take, but we don't know how to put it together. And one of the things that, as a fashion designer, my job was to take all the pieces, whether it be thread, fabric, buttons, trims, and put it together into something that was beautiful and sellable. So I said, oh, OK, I'm just being asked to do that. All right. So um, today we'll explore the choices for the upcoming transition. And I'm saying the trans we're having a transition back to our kingdom. That's what I see. But before we do that, um, can anyone tell me what's holding us up from transitioning to resurrecting, resurrecting our Hawaiian kingdom? OK, occupation, education, what else? That's it, right there. 
It's ourselves. It's what's between the Pepe Al. It's what we think. It's what we believe. And, and this belief that we are being sold by the occupier is false. We have so many, well, actually, we have three choices. But there's many choices, but I'm narrowing it down to three. But I'm saying what stops our transition right now, us, not understanding how much power we have and how we can move through this very quickly. OK. So the first thing I want you to look at is this is the geographical description of Ko Hawaii Pai Aina. This is our archipelago. Now let's compare it to the description, the jurisdictional description of Hawaii, the 50th state. On the official ballot, that plebiscite, where in 1959, the people of Hawaii voted to become part of the, the, be the 50th state and part of the United States. What I want to first emphasize is what people, okay? The people that were allowed to vote in this was the military and American citizens, okay? So what you have to understand is we're not, we didn't vote for this. And we couldn't vote for this because this isn't our country. You know, United States is in our country. So we weren't denied anything. A lot, this is part of the confusion. We keep being told that we're being denied. Yeah, we're not, we're not US or American citizens. Of course we're being denied. Japanese citizens can't vote. German citizens can't vote. Why would the Kanaka from another country be able to vote? Yeah, okay. So, oh, and also at the top, it's saying that the dis jurisdictional description is what you would find in Public Law 86-3. So let's go look at what Public Law 86-3 is, okay? So this is the Admissions Act of 1959. In the Admissions Act, it describes that, um, that what is getting transferred as the 50th state. Specifically, in section two, it talks about um, the state of Hawaii shall consist of all the islands together with their Apaturian reefs and territorial waters included in the territory of Hawaii. So I'm gonna stop right there. What's the territory of Hawaii? Okay, see this is me being real howly, asking questions. I'm not the, the Hawaiian kid where the tutus say, don't ask questions. I ask questions, okay? And since I knew nothing, I had to ask questions. Now we keep going back on the left. This is Ko Hawaii Pai Aina, okay? If you look on the right, as you go down a little bit lower, it keeps talking about what is not in the 50th state. And when you look, it'll say, the, talk about the different atolls and islands. Well, that's actually in our description of Kohawa'i Pai Aina. So already we're getting a clue that they're not talking about us and, and this geographical era, area. Next, I went and looked at the description of the territory of Hawaii. The ter The territory of Hawaii under the Organic Act law, um, 56-339, again, it goes down and it starts describing what it is, what's being transferred to the United States. So the territory of Hawaii, that the islands acquired by the United States of America under an act of, congressional, of Congress entitled Joint Resolution to provide for annexing the Hawaiian Islands to the United States approved July 7th, 1898, shall be known as the Territory of Hawaii. Well, let's go see what that is. Okay, this gets exciting for me because the more I look, I'm like, wait, what are they talking about here? Okay, so here's the joint resolution. 
and we go down. In the middle, okay, so then it says, whereas the government of the Republic of Hawaii, not the Kingdom of Hawaii, the Republic of Hawaii, having in due form signified its consent in the manner provided by its constitution to cede absolutely and without reservation to the United States of America all rights of sovereignty of whatsoever kind. What kind? Whatsoever kind. It's no kind. It's nothing, okay? Okay, so in and over the Hawaiian Islands and their dependencies. Now, why am I saying it's no kind? Because you need a treaty, right? Did the Hawaiian kingdom give to the Republic of Hawaii the Hawaiian Islands? No. So what do they have? Can you say that louder? That's right. Nothing was given to the United States. Nothing was given to the Republic of Hawaii to give to the United States. Okay, so now we're going down. We're still seeing that's still not the same description. It's still not the same area, right? So here's our islands. Now I began asking the question, what international arena and law mechanisms were used to validate Hawaii was the 50th state of the United States of America? Does anybody know? Actually, there was. What it was was United Nations General Assembly Resolution 1469. It's a session of the transmission of information under Article 73E. Now, what that is, is it was before the decolonization committee was set up, but whenever a government was colonizing or occupying a place, they had to, and providing a government, they had to make a report to the United Nations to tell them, you know, the conditions and to make sure everybody's human rights are being protected. And so under communi the communications portion of their report, it's Annex 2, so it's like a, Exhibit 2 of the report A4226, submitted September 24th, 1959. In Annex 2, page 1, section 2. This is where the jurisdictional description of Hawaii, the 50th state, public law 86-3 can be found. Okay. So public law 86-3 provides for the legal jurisdictional description of the 50th state. This was the criteria used to pass the United Nations General, uh, General Assembly Resolution 1469, which recognized Alaska and Hawaii as the 49th and 50th state of the United States of America. It's because of UN General Assembly Resolution 1469 that the world believes that the U.S. 50th state of Hawaii is located in the Hawaiian Islands. This is what made the world believe that the 50th state is here. So while I was there, because I was listening to Professor Chang and you know all these really smart people with PhDs, because I don't have one, the only PhDs I have is projects half done, and uh, so, what I did was I went to look, okay? So what did they put in there that maybe I didn't understand? So they put this in there. This is what's in that Annex 2. It's talking about, oh no, not this one. It's actually the 86-3 description, okay? So the 86-3 description clearly says um, that it's a diff well, it's a different description than what we see for the meets and bounds of the Hawaiian Islands, right? So I was able, in one of these meetings after I made that political declaration, that um, uh, I was able to meet with some of these experts. And I asked them, I said, your description gives, gives this description of Hawaii the 50th state. 
And the description for the meets and bounds of the Hawaiian Islands are this. And I showed them the maps that you saw up there. And I said, can you read the, the description that the UN accepted in 1959 out loud for us to hear? So we read it. And I, then I had the map of the Hawaiian Islands. And I said, OK, I know you can't say these words, so I'm going to say it for you. But can you look in that description to see if, in fact, these islands are in there? So I read the name of all the islands. And he said, no, it's not in there. So as we're sipping tea, I just very casually said, um, so is there a law in 1959 that allowed one country to take another country without Anybody, which country they were taking. And he said, no. And I said, is there a law today that allows one country to take another country without saying what country they're taking or what area they're taking? He says, no. So as I'm taking a sip of my tea, I say to him, so who do I sue for taking my inheritance? And he, and he, very, very gentlemanly put his teacup down on the table, threw up his arms, and he said, and that's how you get your kingdom back. And so I said, okay, how? Because <laughs> I, I still didn't get it. <laughs> so I said, how do we do this? And he says, well, there's this legal principle called ergo omnes. Ergo omnes is, in the case of the UN, when they make a mistake, they have to correct it. If they don't correct it, the liability for injury goes to them. I go, OK, so how do I do that? So I wrote a petition. A petition. It took me a long time. We submitted it last December. And in the petition, I am asking for an intervention and an investigation for um, my home being taken. Now, I'm going to have to step back a little bit and tell you that in 2010, after I was battling the, the property tax division for overcharging us on our um, ag status um, exemption, so in, the, in their laws, it says that you pay a dollar per acre plus what I think it was $29 per building, but the 5,000 square feet that your house is on, you are charged the taxes basically that your neighbors are charged. So my neighbors were in the, um, were in the country zone. So when I looked at the averages of what people were charged, it varies because you know, it depends on their house, you know, how fancy it is or not fancy. So my neighbors were, I believe it was between 11 and $17 a square foot they were being charged for the year. And I noticed that myself and my other farmer neighbor that had the ag ex, um, status and uh, um, exemption, we were being charged 68 and $69 a square foot. And so I said, wait a minute, you give it and then you take it away? And I said, no, 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 no. OK, you're not following the rules. So I went down, and I, I really pushed hard. And I said, I want to know how you came up with that assessment. Come to find out that they took whatever the closest 5,000 square foot lot was, and they charged us that rate. Well, those are beach houses on the beach that are millions of dollars. And I said, I don't own a beach house that's worth millions of dollars. And I said, no, the rules, your rules say this. And so I kept pursuing it. We went through the, um, the board review, and they still wouldn't follow their rules. But one of the people from the property tax division kind of pulled me to the side and said, well, you're Hawaiian. Why don't you go for the Kuleana land tax exemption? I really didn't understand it, but I said, OK, I'll do that. So um, we went ahead, and we did that. We put in our paperwork into OHA, and within one month, I got a phone call back that said, I'm sorry, we can't approve you because you don't own your home. And I was like, wait a minute. What do you mean I don't own our home? We paid cash for this home in 1998. There's no loans. We own it. And they said, oh, no, no, no. 
your lands or the house, uh, your house is on lands that were made inalienable in 1865. And I was like, what's that mean? Okay, so inalienable means it can't be sold after January 3rd, 1865. So then it started me on this journey that landed me here because I was saying, wait a minute, if, it, if I can't own this, then what do I have? What's this warranty deed that I have? Well, I looked it up in Black's Law Dictionary, and a warranty deed is a likeness of ownership, but no ownership, just the color of title. And I said, okay, but what, do we, what did we buy? You know, and um, we bought nothing, basically. And so I said, okay, who does own these lands? So the lands were Kamehameha III's lands. And I said, oh, okay, so who's going to pay us back? You know, so we went for the title insurance. We got denied because they said, oh, no, 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 those lands were ceded to the United States, you know, and, and uh, through the territory and then, you know, and then ceded to the, the state of Hawaii in 1959. And, you know, of course, I'm, my head's spinning because I'm thinking, oh, my God, we put so much money into this and now we have equity in addition to what we paid and the title insurance only covers what you pay. So I'm going, okay, where do we get the equity from? You know, this was like our retirement. How do we, how do we fix this? And so, I guess it's the pake in me. I couldn't let one penny go away, so I had to keep following this thing. And um, as I was going down this road and asking more about, you know, what is this, you know, the, the king's lands and, and what is seated and what is all these things, that's where I got the clarity that nothing was ever seated because of those, the meets and bounds I talked about, right? So we know seated because the Republic of Hawaii that was in the seed had no, nothing to seed of whatsoever cause. Okay, so now that's when I said um, I kept going to the courts and um, I refused to pay for my um, property taxes anymore until somebody could show me how their title, how the state's title superseded the allodial title, which is in perpetuity. And so, um, of course, since I think I started asking in 2011, the, I, there's been no production of documents. So when I started looking even further, I was saying, okay, besides needing the proof, we needed to show that, that these lands were transferred before January 3rd, 1865, when it became illegal to sell anything. So the city and county of Hawaii wasn't around in 1865. The state of Hawaii wasn't around in 1865. And the United States was in a friendly treaty in 1865. And the reason I know these particular lands were never transferred was because in King Kamehameha's the third's probate, Kamehameha IV asked the Supreme Court that six ahupua'a would be eliminated from any kind of sale. Oh, okay. Um, okay, you can take it down. I'll just read here. Um, so the, um, the 1865, uh, we knew that, that the United States didn't give and receive these lands from King Kamehameha V, who was the one that passed this law to prevent the king's lands from being sold any further. We know he didn't transfer it. Do you know how we know this? Because when there was the so-called seeding of the land, Pupukea Ahupua'a was still part of the inventory. Okay? So these lands were never sold. They were never transferred. And because there's a difference between lands that, even in a treaty, when, you, when there's a treaty between countries, the only thing they can transfer is government lands. They cannot tr give somebody's private property. King Kamehameha III 
was very smart. He knew that if he was to be um, conquered and he owned all the lands in the Hawaiian kingdom, with one fail swoop, the Hawaiian kingdom was gone. But if he split it up amongst all his people, now the allodial title was split and the, con the conquering country could not take private lands. So even his own lands, he accepted them as private lands. So the only thing at stake was a little over a million acres that belong as government lands. So if there was a treaty between the kingdom and the United States, only the government lands would have been transferred. Okay? So now we know that there were no lands that were transferred. And so now, where, where do we go next? Oh, shucks, I should have shown this one. Okay, so next is the Internal Revenue Code. Now, the Internal Revenue Code comes from the United States when they were going through their bankruptcy in 1933. When you go through a bankruptcy, you need to have somebody that administrates the, the paying of the bills to the creditors. So all the debts that the creditors have, they'll sell off your assets and then they'll pay the creditors, okay? So the administrating um, corporation that was set up is called the United States Corporation. And their accounting firm is the Internal Revenue Service. They're the ones that collect the money, and deliver it to the creditors. So the creditors are the, it's England, it's the international bankers, it's the Vatican. It, it's, it's all of that, right? And um, so when you pay taxes every year, um, you are not paying to set up infrastructure and take care of infrastructure in our areas. You are paying money to pay off a debt to the creditors of the United States um, bankruptcy. And um, so all US citizens are sureties for the debt of the United States. So are you US citizens? I mean, we were never taken, right? So I don't think I'm a US citizen by their own definitions, but let, let's look at their definition. So the Internal Revenue Code IRC 7701, Section 9 and 10. This, this is their definitions of words and how they apply um, uh, everything to, to fit within their system. If it doesn't fit within this definition, it's not part of it, okay? So Section 9, the term United States, when used in a geographical sense, includes only the states and the dis District of Columbia. Number 10, the term state shall be construed to include the District of Columbia where such con construction is necessary to carry out provisions of this title and that when definition statutes are issued with the word includes, quote unquote, it means that only the items or categories listed in the definition are included. Everything else is excluded. So by their own admission, the Hawaiian Islands are not the 50th state. Okay, so that the District of Columbia is a political state of the United States, it is a 10 mile square and their statues only include purchase property of the federal government, which includes the US possessions like Guam and the Virgin Islands. Since the 50th states are not mentioned in the definition of the state, they are not included. So not even the 50th states are included. Okay, so now let me explain this because this took me some time to understand. There is America, and when you look at the way they spell it, they'll say the United States of America. United is not all capital. It's not even capital on the first letter. It's a lower case because it just means we all come together, okay? This is the republic where the people are the sovereigns, where the people are American citizens, okay? 
Now we go into America, um, the United States, and United States citizens. Well, if you look at all states, the states are incorporated. The state of Hawaii is incorporated. The counties are incorporated. Well, how do you know that? Well, when you go and talk to their attorneys, you have to go to corporate counsel. You see? This is a corporation. Now, is this corporation any different than Costco? How about 24-hour fitness? Same, right? OK. And this, this um, corporation is registered in the 10 square miles of Washington, DC, the District of Columbia. So with, following the logic that we've been going down, where is the 50th state located? That's right, the 10 mile square in Washington, DC. So you see how we've been misled, right? Okay, so uh, let me go down. Okay, so now we have to look at what is the difference between the different citizens and, and when you take an allegiance to a place. So an American citizen is a flesh and blood human person. It's a living person. Now, the, that's, you'll see your name spelled with, an, with the first letter as a capital and the rest lowercase. That's the living person. The corporate person, you will find in your pockets. Open up your, your wallets and see what's written on your driver's license. That's right. It's the corporate person, your name in all capital. Now, the, the corporation, because it's only, um, it's not a government, that means they only have jurisdiction over their members. Okay, so let's take Costco, for example. Now, if you pay to be a member of Costco, can you go into Sam's Club? Well, you paid money, and um, it is the same, but, and they sell the same things, basically, and they're trying to make it look like it's all the same, right? But you voluntarily step into the system, you're being defrauded. But we don't even know that we're stepping into the system, so why would we even look for those rules, right? So that's part of how we get trapped in. Okay. Okay, so what I'm seeing is, you know, how do we, how do we move forward? Because I see, you know, I have people telling me, okay, we want a new constitution, we want to be, we want a, um, a republic. Well, a republic is what there was, the, the Republic of Hawaii, and what were they called? They were called traitors and treasonous, right? So why would it be different now? So most people are saying, not most, some people say to me, well, the kingdom is gone. And I said, well, who made it gone if there's no treaty? And um, so I, that's one of the questions that I asked when I went to the UN. I go, well, is it that we just don't have a go our own government, our own people running the government? and providing government services, or is it gone? And um, one of the things that I asked for was a letter. When I put in my, my um, petition, I wanted a letter of acknowledgement that they were saying they got the petition and um, that they'd be looking into it and that sort of thing. And I'm gonna see if it'll come up and I'm gonna read it to you. Okay, I need, I need my glasses for this. Okay, so this was dated February 25th of this year. It was given, it was written by Dr. Alfred M. Desias, a United Nations independent expert for the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. That's where I submitted the petition. 
And it was addressed to Honorable Gary W. B. Chang and Honorable Jeanette H. Castanetti and members of the judiciary for the state of Hawaii regarding the case of Madame Bolome. As a professor of international law, the former secretary of the UN Human Rights Committee, co-author of the book, The United Nations Human Rights Committee Case Law, 1977 through 2008, and currently serving as a UN independent expert on the promotion of a democratic and equitable international order. I have come to understand that the lawful political status of the Hawaiian Islands is that of a sovereign nation in continuity. The kingdom still exists by this expert's opinion. Now this expert, just as a side note, he is the one that has, um, uh, these independent experts are hired by the UN to put together reports in very specific areas, and they take these unbiased reports, and this is what's used by the High Commissioner and by the General Assembly to vote and make decisions. So this is pretty important stuff. I didn't expect to get something this good. Okay. By a nation state that is under a strange form of occupation by the United States resulting from an illegal military operation and a fraudulent annexation. So I'm going to read that again. I have come to understand that the lawful political status of the Hawaiian Islands is that of a sovereign nation in continuity, but a nation state that is under a strange form of occupation by the United States resulting from an illegal military occupation and a fraudulent annexation. As such, international law, the Hague and Geneva Conventions, require the governance and legal matters within the occupied territories of the Hawaiian Islands must be administered by the application of law of the occupied state, in this case, the Hawaiian Kingdom not the domestic laws of the occupier, the United States. Based on that understanding in paragraph 69N of my 2013 report, A-68284, to the United Nations General Assembly, I recommended that the people of the Hawaiian Islands and other peoples and nations in similar situations be provided access to the UN procedures and mechanisms in order to exercise their rights protected under international law. The adjudication of land transactions in the Hawaiian Islands would likewise be a matter of Hawaiian Kingdom law and international law, not domestic US law. I have reviewed the complaint submitted in 2017 by Madame Ruth Bolome to the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, pointing out historical and ongoing plundering of Hawaiians lands particularly of those heirs and descendants with land titles that originated from the distribution of lands under the authority of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Pursuant to the, to the U.S. Supreme Court judgment in the Paquette Habana case 1900, U.S. courts have to take international law and customary international law into account in property disputes. The state of Hawaii courts should not lend themselves to a flagrant violation of the rights of the land title holders and in consequence of pertinent international norms. Therefore, the courts of the state of Hawaii must not enable or collude in the wrongful taking of private lands, bearing in mind the right to property is recognized not only in the United States laws, but also in Article 17 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted under the leadership of Eleanor Roosevelt. Respectfully, Dr. Alfred M. Desias. So this is a gift, not just to me, but to all of us. And this comes from the work of everybody. I just put the pieces together. I saw the pieces and I packaged it into something that was comprehensible and simple because that's the only way my mind could understand it because it's a very complex situation. And what I'm realizing is that 
this is a first step. It was greater than I ever hoped to get. There's still more to do. There's still more processes to do. But it's a very encouraging first step that I think should give us more than just hope. I think what it should be doing is letting us know it's time to get ready for the transition. Okay? Now, as all of us were given U.S. citizenships, American citizenships, and a lot of us are under um, uh, our descendants, lineal descendants of subjects of the Hawaiian Kingdom prior to January 17th, 1893, okay? Because that's the last time that we were able to naturalize our people. So there are these three categories. Now, the United States can't force you not to be a U.S. citizen, and they can't force you not to be an American citizen. This is where the choice comes in. Now, some people I know, the, the older people, they were telling me, you know what, I don't want to shake the boat. I'm very comfortable where I'm at, and so I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to remain a U.S. citizen. Okay, who am I to... to tell somebody that they have to be something other than what they're comfortable with. And then there's others that um, I explain to them what it is to be a U.S., I mean, an American citizen. Well, an American citizen, you are the sovereigns, you know, and you have all the protections under the U.S. Constitution, the rights and the protections of the U.S. Constitution. Now, as a U.S. citizen, you don't have rights and protections under the U.S. Constitution. You are not the sovereigns. I'm going to be crude. And everything you inherited and everything that you own, including your child, is owned by the United States Corporation. So let's choose very carefully what it is that we want to be. Do we want to be the sureties of the U.S. debt and be owned by them? Or do we want to be U.S. citizens, I mean, American citizens, that, have, um, that has protections under the United States Constitution? Or do we want to be, or if we qualify, are we going to take our allegiance to the Hawaiian Kingdom Constitution, which is a constitution um, with a monarch. So the people are not sovereigns. And see, this is one of the things where I hear people saying, no, no, I want to be the sovereign. You know what? I don't know anybody that can be the sovereign. None of us are prepared, right? We've, we've been in captivity being told that we were something other than we were. We weren't being trained to lead our country, but there is provisions wow. in the Hawaiian Kingdom Constitution where the high chief's lineal descendants make up the House of Nobles. So there is a process for transitioning into being a government with a monarchy sometime in the future. But today we have, today, every day from here on out, we, when you know you have a choice, you have to start talking about your families and say, how do you want to proceed? Do we like being American citizens? You know, that's a very organized government. Do we want to go back to being subjects of the kingdom and take full allegiance to the constitutions that were ratified and in place? That's different. So one of the things I'm going to suggest is start reading the constitutions from the beginning from 1839, and go all the way forward, even the ones that were the naughty ones. Go and read them, because when I read it now, I didn't really get it. You know, it's just a bunch of words. But the more I read it, the more I see how much love for the people is in there, and all the protections and everything to make sure our kingdom stays intact. Our people are taken care of. Our people are not overtaxed. You know the division of land? 
you're not charged property tax because under the king's land, that paid for the whole executive branch. That's not from taxation. There are taxes, but there's like sustainability built into everything. We keep talking about like it's a new concept about being sustainable. No, we were sustainable. We were 100% sustainable till 1933 when all of a sudden it became um, not in the interest of the shipping lines for us to be sustainable. We started having monocropping. We started bringing in food so that the, the containers that were going one way full of sugarcane and pineapple that were coming back empty was now filled with things that we could have, that we could buy, that could entrap us into a lifestyle that we become slaves. Okay? So we need to understand how we're getting trapped, how we're getting in. And you know what? It's not a trap when you make a choice and you say, I want that. I'm okay with that. It's okay to make any choice. Yeah? So where do we go from here? Now we know that we have three choices. We know that we're going to go talk to our, our families and say, how do we want to proceed? So if you proceed as being, um, and you qualify, because you can go to the CUE petition, to the registries, to the naturalization documentation, to the censuses, and you can show that your family were um, subjects of the kingdom, prior to January 17th, 1893, now you can, you can, you have different choices, okay? So one is, how are you going to participate? The first thing that I see in participating is not from the top down. It's from the bottom up. It starts in our backyards. It starts with a garden that I like to call Malaea, the sovereignty garden, yeah? All of us can do that, even if it's a little pot, you know? And then we just grow it bigger, and we get our ohana coming in and helping us and our friends, and, and once we get our set, we go help our neighbor. And then when we get our neighbor, we go help our, and build our ahupua'a, and once our ahupua'a is set up, we go to our neighbor's ahupua'a and we help them. And each ahupua'a has something unique and special. So we want to help the next ahupua'a because maybe they have fish or soil or something that we in our ahupua'a. Because what's preserved in ahupua'as is our native tenant rights. Now our native tenant rights are for those living tenants in the Ahupua'a. So just like Costco and Sam's Club, if you live in this, in Wainai Ahupua'a, you have rights to water in Pupukea Ahupua'a. No, you don't. See, one of the things that the U.S. did was they try to make it look like that we have, um, they, they redefined native tenant rights but you have to go back and look at the Kanaka Maloko and, and the native tenant rights under the Mahele where you see all the preservations. It tells you exactly what you're entitled to, okay? So the way we have access to things in other ahupua'a is that we help them be successful in bringing everything up to its highest fruition. Now once we have our ahupua'a set up, we work on our districts. Within that, we have our schools. We have our education. Now, do we need education for Honolulu if we're living in Waianae? No, it's a whole different system. You know, you have different weather patterns, you have different soil, you have different water conditions. It's all about taking care of eating first, right? Because without water and food, you can't help in government. So we need to start in our own backyards, and we have to grow. And then from there, the other thing that I saw was we need to live in love and in gratitude. 
We need to not only love families, but we need to love every single person. This is emotional for me. But every single person that's here and that's beyond, that's helping us understand who we are. You know, this petition that I did, it was not um, from my knowledge, because I have no knowledge in this kind of stuff. I took Keanu's work. I took Keeley's work. I took, you know, everybody's work. Donovan's work, you know, Donovan Prez's work. All the different people that are making headway. I looked at what they were doing and I was saying, wow, these are like different pieces of the puzzle that's part of the whole. If we can't appreciate and have gratitude for the next person, and all that's being done, even if we can see, have criticisms because they're not getting it completely right. You know what, from their part of the world and, and their ohana, that's all they're allowed to see and do, okay? I don't know how to fish. I need to rely on other people catching fish. But you know what, I can look at these documents and I can see things that maybe somebody else didn't see. So all of us need to really come together and move united as one, recognizing that, yeah, recognizing that each and every one of us are being called by our kupuna to bring something to the table, okay? And, and so from, from this perspective, you know, I invite all of you to start your malaea and any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yes. I am giving a copy of the letter to people that are in cases at this point. Because we, we I gave the letter to somebody, I gave the letter to somebody and it got into the wrong hands um, of a, somebody that's a foreigner. And they're trying to use what would, would actually a gift for us to, and they can actually ruin it for us, you know, by getting somebody to, getting a court to rule that this does not apply. Well, the case would be that it doesn't apply to them. But then there would still be a precedent. So if you're working with somebody, you know, like I'm going to give Keeley the letter and um, so you guys can have a copy. So somebody that can guide you on how to use it then I'll be happy to share it with you. Okay, I have to do a couple steps still at the UN and, um, and then I'll be posting it. Okay, then it's, because it's everybody's gift, but I just want to make sure that we're able to follow through on the steps that we need to do without distraction or blockages. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Well, you're asking an officer in the military to disclose the strategy. <laughs> so actually, yeah, so actually what, to me, the next step is, you know, you can have people doing stuff on the governmental levels, but if the people aren't ready to transition, it's not gonna happen. So the next step that we can all do is prepare ourselves, educate ourselves, know what, con what our Hawaiian Kingdom Constitution is, because, one of the things that I learned um, when I was reading the constitutions and reading about other countries that, that made a successful transition was they couldn't change anything until they were actually back in control. Okay, so, but you can prepare the changes that you wanna make. So when you are back in control, within an hour you have everything that you want, you know? So, this is all part of the preparation, and this is, you know, there's going to be leaders in your ahupua'a that are farmers, but there's also going to be 
kupuna that have so much wisdom that can see patterns, right? And see how we need to move. And they would be probably part of the kupuna council that would be guiding us. And those would be representing the districts and the different ahupua'as. So everybody can have a voice, but it's grassroots. You don't want to be dictated from the top down. You want to, this is how you have your voice. We have all the systems in place. It's been in place for, you know, eons since the kingdom. And it worked. Okay? We see what it looks like to be in a centralized system, and it doesn't work. It doesn't serve our people. And so we need to get back to the roots, to our soils. My fingernails have red dirt because I was planting before I came here. You know, it's like we need to do that. Okay? Yes. Yes. He said we need to become the Maka'ai Nana of the past. And we also have to be open to bringing in modern technology. Okay? Because I don't think any of us are, we are ready to give up our phones or our computers or the internet to see how the rest of the world is interacting and what's going on. So we need to be realistic on how do we merge the two together in a way that it serves us and it doesn't diminish our cultural practices and what we hold of high value. Yes. Yes. Well, we have lots of copy machines, and, and there's, but it costs money for paper and ink. And I myself am limited to how much I could put out, you know, because of, you know, financial limitations. This is a full time job with no paycheck, you know? So, so yes, I have to um, make choices on who I can share information with, and, you know, and I want to put it in the hands where it's going to make the biggest difference and the biggest impact. Yeah? It's not that I'm, I'm trying to eliminate anybody. It's just that when I look at how can we make huge impacts, you know, how do we do that? Yes. Yep. Right. In perpetuity.
Well, we have, we have um, to, we need leaders on, and representation on the international level. So we need all those people that are taking, I'm gonna say that has the audacity to take a leadership role. But you know what? It's hard to do it. And that's why we have to appreciate everybody that's willing to take us banging up the side of their head saying they're doing it wrong, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Now I'm going to I'm going to suggest two more things. So for you to get back onto your lands, your real lands, the one that your kupuna got in the Mahele, you're going to have to one be a subject of the kingdom. Okay? So how do you look at that? Clara Pana sitting here was with me at my house and for days I couldn't sleep. My tutu, John Mahi'ai Kaniakua, kept coming to me and saying, you need to get that kue petition out. You need to get the people to find their kupuna. And Claire kept seeing me getting up and couldn't sleep. And she goes, what's the matter? And I told her. And she goes, okay, I'll do it. And she actually got her sister to make a database that helps us. I don't know if you've seen the books for the Kuwait petition. It's impossible to read the, the handwriting at times, and it's impossible to find your kupuna. But she and her sister put together a database that helps you find your kupuna, okay? That's the first step or one of the steps or, or a resource that you can use to verify that your kupuna was a subject of the kingdom. The other step is there was a roster that um, naturalized people that took an oath to the Republic of Hawaii. There was about 4,000 people that did that, okay? Not all the people of Hawaii. So 4,000 people that did that. If your kupuna took an oath to the Republic of Hawaii, they were not a subject of the kingdom, right? They, they were granted American citizenship. Okay, now if their lineal descendants wants to become a subject of the kingdom, from what I understand is they have to wait until our government is up, our naturalization department is up, and they have to apply for naturalization according to the kingdom laws. So it's not impossible, it's just that's the step that they have to do. And then, um, so Claire Apana, I wanted you to, to um, meet her and really look at this database and find your family, okay?